Thank you very much. Thanks for the introduction and uh, the opportunity to speak. Uh, so my name is Thor Heft Anderson. Let's see if I can get my slides up here. So uh, I'm a professor of oncology at Mayo Clinic uh, in Rochester, Minnesota, which is one of the three Mayo Clinic sites. We also have neuroendocrine programs in Florida and in, in Arizona. And we have uh, one member of the Florida team here. So uh, for the next uh, 40 or so minutes, I, I was going to go through neuroendocrine tumors, uh, sort of the basics. It's a lot of ground to cover, so a lot of concepts, a lot of different things I wanted to bring up here and hopefully set the stage for the rest of the uh, uh, this, uh, this meeting. And you're going to hear a lot more detail about the, uh, all of these uh, topics that I just briefly discussed. But I just wanted to sort of set the stage and clarify some of those uh, big words that we use. So these are my disclosures. So these are my objectives. You can sort of read through that to uh, talk about what neuron tumors are, how common they are, uh, what's uh, great, uh, tumor grade, stage, differentiation, all of those things. And if time allows, maybe get into uh, some of the, the concept we, we use for uh, life expectancy. Not necessarily into any numbers, but just uh, what, are we, what do we mean when we talk about uh, overall survival, things like that. So let's get started. Like I said, it's a, it's a long talk, so, uh, so fasten your seat belts and keep your hands inside. We're gonna go through this really fast. So, uh, so what are NEMS? And it's a confusing terminology, and I actually found this helpful. So this is from uh, Through the Looking Glass by Lewis Carroll. When I use a word, Humpty, hum, Humpty Dumpty said in a rather scornful tone, it means just what I choose it to mean, neither more uh, nor less. The question is at Alice whether you can make words mean so many different things. And this is actually one of the things we've dealt with in neuroendocrine tumors is that there are just so many uh, words and used for different things and the same thing, same words used for different things, uh, different words used for the same thing. So neuroendocrine neoplasms or NENs, are we not calling them NETs anymore? Well, actually we should probably be using the term uh, neuroendocrine neoplasm or NEN, N-E-N. So uh, it's, it's a more inclusive umbrella, umbrella term. So, uh, so NEN stands for neuroendocrine neoplasm. NET, neuroendocrine tumor, stands for neuroendocrine tumor. NEC is neuroendocrine carcinoma. So a neoplasm is really an abnormal tissue, cancerous tissue, or may or may not be actually cancerous. It's an abnormal tissue that uh, re uh, ha sort of clump of tissue that uh, results when the cells are dividing where they shouldn't be and, uh, and uh, are not dying when they should. The tumor is a similar de definition, but uh, for neuroendocrine tumors, tumor has a different meaning, and I'll get into that in a little bit. Carcinoma is more like an ag aggressive, uh, invasive uh, cancer that has the ability to spread to other parts of the body. So what are NEMs, neuroendocrine neoplasms? So malignancies, cancers. So don't let anyone tell you that these are not cancers. These are cancers, and, uh, and they can arise pretty much anywhere in the human body and most commonly in the small bowel, in uh, lungs, pancreas, rectum, but they can, uh, I've pretty much seen a NEN anywhere in the body. And they are extremely heterogeneous, so it's almost as if no two NENs are the same. And uh, therefore, they can present in a variety of different ways, which we'll talk about too. And uh, because these uh, tumors, uh, the, the cells where they came from are all over the body, that's why they can actually start anywhere in the body. And why do we get them? So we don't, most, uh, in most cases, we actually don't know. So this is one of my greatest frustrations, and I am asked this every week, why did I get this cancer? And I have, uh, most of the time, I have no idea. There are some uh, patients who come from families where there are multiple patients with neuroendocrine neoplasms. Some have certain uh, genetic syndrome, like MEN1 or uh, von Hippel-Lindau, or some of the even less common uh, syndromes. But most of the time, we just don't no, we do know this though. If you have a small bowel neuroendocrine tumor, then your children or your siblings probably have about five to ten times uh, increased risk of getting a neuroendocrine tumor. But because of these tumors being so small, their risk is still really low. Meaning, if you take a really, really low number and you multiply it by ten, it's still going to be a really low number. There are some thoughts that this may be, uh, there, uh, this increase we're seeing may be due to certain things in the environment. There are really interesting studies from, from uh, Utah looking at the clustering around the, like mining towns and the industry sites, but none of that has been proven. That could all just be a pure coincidence. So we need to study this better, and we really haven't done what we should have been doing in terms of uh, looking at the environmental causes for this. 
So how common are NENs? Is it worth having a three-day conference about NENs? Certainly it is. So these are uh, actually not that rare at all. And we're seeing more of them. So, uh, and we need to raise awareness of uh, neuron consumers. And this probably shows this better than anything else. So, in, uh, so I'm just going to walk you through this. So the incidence, and the incidence is the number of new cases over a certain period of time. And we talk about incidence very often, the number of new uh, cases in a population of 100,000 people. For me, it's actually very easy. I'm from Rochester in Minnesota. Rochester has about 100,000 people. So I explained it to pa patients. So if, it in, in, if the incidence is seven, that means in a town like Rochester, in a given calendar year, there should be seven new cases. So that's how we come up with these incidence numbers. Prevalence is a different number. And these is, this is like Epidemiology 101. So uh, prevalence is actually the number of people living with the cancer at any given time point. So if I were to poll everyone in the US uh, and say, do you have neuron tumor or not? And I would get a number, assuming everyone got back to me, and that would be the prevalence number. So that's the number of people dealing with it at that given time. So, uh, so the overall, the incidence is about seven. Of them, gastrointestinal neurocrine neoplasms are about half, and the median age of uh, a diagnosis, or the average age, is 63 years. So if you look at the blue line here, let's see if I can point at this here. So if you look at this line, this is all cancer. So, uh, so, and this goes back to 1973, all the way up to 2012. So you can see that for all cancers, there was an increase, peaked in the early 90s, and then cancer, the total number of new cancers in the US has actually been going down. And I think that's largely due to better sort of lifestyle choices, less smoking, and also screening for colon cancer. So, um, so we've seen a slight decrease in the number of new cases uh, of all cancers. But if you look at the orange curve, these are the NETs, or the NENs, actually. I should, re uh, should label that NENs. So you can see that there has been sevenfold increase in the number of new uh, neuroendocrine neoplasm diagnoses since the early 70s uh, until 2012. And we'll talk about why this is, although it looks alarming, there might be some uh, reasons for this that they're maybe not so alarming. So, and we see this across all types of nets. So these are similar uh, survive, uh, sim similar incidence curves going back to 1973 up to 2012. We look at the lungs, more lung nets. Small bowel, more of them. You can see that green curve there. We look at the rectum, more of that. I think a lot of that is actually due to colonoscopies. People have screening colonoscopies and we're looking for polyps or colon cancer and we found a neuroendocrine tumor in the rectum. So. Probably, in some cases, those patients may, might have lived with that for their entire life without ever knowing and died without ever knowing they had it. But just because we did a colonoscopy, we found it. So, uh, and then lastly, a particular research interest of mine is the pancreatic neuron tumors. And you can see that it's not until the last few years we saw this really sharp increase. So, and this is everywhere. So, if you look at the increases over time, we are looking at like... Uh, the US, Norway, uh, France, Ireland, Canada, the Netherlands, and these curves are just looking at two different time points. And these two different time points vary from one study to the next. But what it's meant to show that wherever you're looking, there is an increase. We're seeing more uh, of these tumors. And if you look at the incidence, uh, which is roughly uh, seven for all neuron tumors, this is only looking at gastroenteropancreatic neuron tumors. You can see that it's remarkably similar across uh, the, the globe. It's actually interesting. I didn't realize that until this morning that the United States with 3.56 and my home country of Iceland, 3.85, are almost next to each other, meaning that uh, the incidence is very similar. For some reason, the Norwegians are a little bit of an outlier. That could be that they just they might just have better cancer registry. They might be capturing stuff that we're not capture, ca capturing, or I don't know, or maybe they're just common there. And uh, <clears throat> well, moving on, so why are these becoming more common? I think a large part of it is better scans. And not just better scans, but more scans. So now you can barely like walk by an emergency room. You're going to get a CT scan. Someone's going to drag you in there and do a CT scan. And if you go to the ED with abdominal pain or you fell, you're cleaning the gutters of your house and you fell, you're probably going to get a CT scan. So we're getting a lot of these people who got, went into the emergency room with something or another, got a CT scan. And by the way, there's a tumor in your pancreas. Did you know about that? And, uh, and uh, so now we're finding a lot of tumors that we probably would never have known about. And then also, I think the healthcare providers are getting better. They're just getting more sort of aware of this. And, uh, and even if you account for all of that, I think there's still a real increase in the incidence.
So let's zoom in on pancreatic nets. So this is work from, from Mayo from this year. So this is actually looking back to the year 2000. And, the, and these different bars are the, uh, the number of, uh, of, uh, of uh, neuron tumors. So the, uh, the green bars are people who have, di uh, have metastatic disease or stage 4 diagnosis. The red bars are those who have lymph node involvement. The blue bars are those who have early disease. And and we have seen that there is a threefold increase since 2000. From 2000 to 2016, threefold increase in, in that short time span of new diagnosis. This is the, the closest we have to a U.S. cancer database. So it's a pretty good database. It reflects about 26 or 28 percent of the U.S. population. So this is, we're talking a really large database. So why is that? And if we look at this, it's almost all uh, accounted for by diagnosis of early stage localized pancreatic neuron tumors. And that goes back to my previous point of us doing more scans for different things. Uh, when I was doing my medical uh, training in Iceland, if you had a really bad car accident and you went to the ED, you're never going to get a CT scan. You'll just get someone to push in your belly, and if it's not sore, you, you watch you for an hour and you go home. So now everyone gets, uh, gets uh, uh, a CT scan, which is good medicine, but we're just uh, seeing all of these uh, tumors being diagnosed for because of scans that uh, that uh, are done for to totally un unrelated reasons. Well, so switching gears to tumor grade and differentiation. This is incredibly important to understand. So you got to know your tumor. And um, so when we talk about the tumor grade and differentiation, these are uh, factors we use to predict how, thing, how, how the tumors will behave over time. So the nets can be really slow growing and they can be really fast growing. And that's determined by the grade. And grade one can move really slow. Grade three can move really fast. But there's a lot of differences. Some of the grade threes actually don't move that fast. Some of the grade ones are in a really bad location and much more a threat to your life and health than a, a grade three tumor in a better location. So it's not just about grade. And uh, I want to, I'm going to test you on this at the end of the day. So you have to memorize this table. No, I'm just I'm kidding. You don't have to do that. So, so uh, what, what, what I wanted to show here is this is the current classification scheme for neurons craniaplasms of the, uh, uh, the, the GI tract and the pancreas. And really what I wanted to point out here is that uh, down at the, the bottom table here, so for the grade 1, grade 2, and grade 3 well-differentiated neurons craniaplasms, those are called neurons crane tumors. For the poorly differentiated tumors, they, those are called carcinomas, net versus necks. So what is differentiation then? So, well, let's first talk about what is great. So a tumor grade is a way to determine how aggressive a tumor will be. And we can do that by staining the tumor, almost like staining your deck. So it's you stain with a, a tissue stain, the tumor, the stain only sticks to uh, the tumor cells that are actively growing. So this is called KS67. You'll hear, you've heard this before, and also called MIP1 in some places. The more dividing cells, more growing cells, uh, the more cells will pick up the stain and be positive. So how does this actually look uh, in the microscope? It looks like this. So this here is a grade 1 neuron tumor. You can see that there are very, very few brown dots. So this is a grade 1. Less than 3% of the cells are ac actively dividing. The rest of them are just sitting there and doing nothing. And grade 2 is a, a positivity from 3 to 20. This is a grade three. This is probably a case seven of like 80 plus percent. So this is the tumor grade. This tells us, uh, this is very, very important in predicting outcomes and behavior of tumors, but it's not the whole story. So that's the differentiation. So, so the key to look at or predict behavior of grade three tumors is to look at the differentiation. So what is differentiation? So that's really how the tumors look in the microscope. So that requires a really good pathologist to look at this uh, in the microscope. And even the best pathologists disagree about a third uh, of the time at least. So there can be really well differentiated, slow growing grade three tumors and uh, very aggressive grade three carcinomas. So it's, uh, the differentiation is really how much does the, do the cancer cells resemble uh, the normal cells uh, it actually originated from? So does it look sort of be well behaved or does it look aggressive? And does it look like this or does it look like that? So my wife's a pathologist and, she's, uh, and one of her, her uh, mentors said that uh, 
when it was looking at poorly differentiated uh, cells in the microscope, he said, always said to her, these are cells you don't want to meet in a dark alley at night. And uh, so uh, so they, they some, can sometimes a good pathologist could just look in the microscope and, th and knows immediately. But sometimes it's actually really hard. So all poorly differentiated neuroendocrine uh, Car carcinomas are grade three, but not all grade three uh, neoplasms are poorly differentiated. So this is incredibly important too. And this is, has led to a lot of over-treatment where people are getting treatments too aggressive for that tumor and has also led to some under-treatment where people are not getting the uh, appropriate treatment. So it's very important. And we'll go into that uh, a little bit later. So what about stage? So stage is really the extent of the disease. So where is it? So stage zero, we almost never see stage zero in our endocrine neoplasms. That's a carcinoma in site two. So let's say like a few cancer cells in the lining of this, the colon under the stomach. We occasionally see this on biopsies. Stage one is localized. Stage two is uh, still uh, localized, but the larger tumor. Stage three has now gone typically into lymph nodes. Stage four is the highest states, that's when the tumor has gone places, liver, bones, uh, somewhere else. So this is how that looks. So uh, states uh, one and two limited to the site of the origin of the tumor. Stage three is when it's in the lymph nodes. If this is, for example, the colon, you can see the, uh, the lymph nodes around the colon. Stage four is when it's gone to the liver and lungs. So moving on again to the symptoms of nets. Uh, so uh, what are the symptoms? This is obviously could be a talk on its own. So that's, but I will say this, that the, the diagnosis is delayed. Symptoms are very nonspecific. So some like subtle symptoms of not feeling well, abdominal discomfort, that sort of stuff. And uh, the tumor characteristics actually dictate to a large extent how the symptoms will be. A slow-growing tumor may not have any symptoms unless it's producing hormones or has been in there for years or even decades. A poorly differentiated neuroendocrine carcinoma typically has a short uh, course. So someone be began having symptoms like six uh, uh, weeks or four months ago, but was perfectly fine around this time last year. So much shorter course of uh, symptoms. And the symptoms are coming on pretty quick. And uh, also depends on the location of the tumors. You can have a small, tiny little tumor that causes bowel blockage, but that's all there is. But it's just in a critical location can cause bowel blockage. And then these tumors can be what's called functional. They can make stuff. They can make chemicals that make you sick. And we'll talk about that. So the symptoms from the tumor itself, so uh, so you can have crampy abdominal pain from small bowel obstruction, jaundice, or turning yellow because the bile duct is blocked, uh, cough uh, or recurrent uh, pneumonia because there is an air, airway that's blocked. It can bleed, uh, you can cough up blood, you can see blood in the, uh, in the toilet or in the, in the stools. There can be pain depending on where the tumors are. Or you can just palpate the lump. Uh, so that occasionally happens. Someone comes into the clinic and say, I just realized I have this really like like egg-sized uh, lump in my neck. And uh, or it can be really non-specific symptoms, just not feeling well and uh, and uh, losing weight, thing, just uh, thing, things of that nature. And then we have the functional tumor. So carcinoid syndrome is the best known functional syndrome. This is almost always from small bowel neuron tumors, but sometimes from lung nets, almost never from pancreatic nets or any of the high grade, the neuron carcinomas. Flushing of the skin often worsened if you have a, uh, especially a glass of wine, but all alcohol can trigger it. Exercise, emotional upset. And a lot of times the flushing is very sort of, uh, uh, quiet, uh, sort of quiet in the sense it doesn't, uh, these are cold uh, flushes. So sometimes the patient don't really know that they are flushing. And you ask the patient, do you ever flush? And he's nah, never, 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 never seen that. And then actually the spouse says, eh, no, then think of it. Maybe you've, you've been doing this for like five years. And whenever you have a glass of uh, wine, so some people just naturally flush. Uh, when, when I'm at the podium running out of time. You'll see me flush. I can guarantee that. And uh, so uh, diarrhea can be debilitating. And we're talking like massive diarrhea uh, 15, 20 times a day, or it can be two to three times a day. It can be only be in the morning. So the diarrhea is, is very variable from one person to the next. Carcinoid heart disease, and then what we always talk about, carcinoid crisis, which thankfully is rare, but does happen. And then we have the hormonal symptoms from the pancreatic nets, uh, so almost always pancreatic nets, although lung nets can do it too. Low blood sugars because of uh, insulin production, stomach ulcers and diarrhea because of a production of a hormone called gastrin. A lot of people realize this like reflux, stomach ulcers, but 
almost all of them have diarrhea as well. And that's very, very frequently overlooked. Some of them have no reflux, only diarrhea and have a gastronoma. That's pro I I've seen that so many times. And then all of the really uh, like r rare uh, syndromes, the uncommon hormones, uh, the really fascinating stuff, but that's uh, very few have that. So the carcinoid syndrome diarrhea, so as I said, flushing and the diarrhea are the most common. We always hear about wheezing. I honestly, I'm not, I don't think I've heard carcinoid wheezing for 10 years. And uh, so it's in all textbooks, but we rarely see it. And um, so most of them are small bowel nets, the carcinoid syndrome, and uh, and not all diarrhea is uh, in, a, some, in someone with, uh, with carcinoid syndrome is from the carcinoid syndrome. So oftentimes patients come to my clinic and say, I have this uh, refractory carcinoid syndrome and my doctor put me on injections. I'm still having diarrhea five times a day and I'm miserable. And uh, then I have to t take what I call the poop history. So I talk about what is the like consistency, the color, what triggers this. And sometimes you sort of know uh, this is not the carcinoid the syndrome. You maybe switched your carcinoid diarrhea out for a different diarrhea. So, and uh, we'll talk about that here in a little bit. So I wanted to talk about this. This is the most commonly overlooked uh, diarrhea in patients with neuronal tumors. This mostly applies to patients who have had the uh, surgical removal of uh, the, uh, the, the far end of the small bowel called the ileum. That's where most of this, uh, the, the carcinoid tumors, the low grade the neuronal tumors of the small bowel live. That, that's where they are. Almost all of them are within 100 uh, uh, centimeters from the colon. And so just a little bit of digestion one-on-one. -on -one. So your liver up here, whenever you eat, the bile goes down the bile duct into your intestines where it helps digest the food you just ate. Then because the body is really economical, it sort of reabsorbs the bile, shuttles it back to the liver because bile is hot commodity. I, it's a, it's a, I spend a lot of energy making this stuff. Let's hang on to it and re, re, reuse it. Well, if we've removed, surgical removed this piece of the bowel, now the bile is not being reclaimed. So now the bile ends up in your colon, and it's a great laxative. And uh, but uh, and often with uh, with like urgency and accidents and things like that. And we can actually measure this uh, 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 chemical here called C4 or 7AC4. And if that's up, that suggests there's bile acid diarrhea. We thought this was all only if patients had really big bowel resections, but we're seeing this in patients with tiny little uh, bowel resection, even patients with neurotic tumors who only had their gallbladder removed and no, no one has touched their small bowel. And this is one of the most rewarding treatments in neurochronology. If you diagnose this correctly and put people in appropriate therapy, that diarrhea can literally go away over, overnight. And uh, so ask your doctor to think about it. Not all diarrhea is carcinoid syndrome diarrhea. So the other diarrhea that just briefly wanted to mention is uh, the, uh, the diarrhea caused by the injection. So the injection slowed down the pancreatic functions, and now you can, are at increased risk of getting diabetes. But the pancreas is no longer pumping out the digestive enzymes you need to digest fat. So now you have what's called steatorrhea. So it's undigested fat in your in, in your stools. So so that's actually pretty common. So this uh, here are a couple of uh, pictures I wanted to show you. So this is from a uh, uh, Canadian medical journal, a few a few years ago, this is probably one of the best pictures of carcinoid flush I've seen. So, and you can see how uh, the gentleman has flushed uh, the cheeks, uh, the the forehead. The other one I wanted to show you is uh, from carcinoid uh, heart disease. So, see that the uh, neck vein here. So, a lot of people have these neck vein dilation, but this gentleman had long-standing carcinoid syndrome, had a severe carcinoid heart disease, and this uh, is one of the first things I noticed when I walked into the room. He had the the, the pulsation up his neck there, and we uh, referred him for an echocardiogram and found that he had carcinoid heart disease. This happens in my clinic probably once every other month. So how does carcinoid heart disease work? So here we have the tumors in the liver. They are releasing this chemical called serotonin, which flows up to your heart into, and uh, gets sort of pumped uh, across the lungs into the right, left side of the heart. And you can see the heart valves, how they get thicker, and then now they're no longer closing. So they get thick and they get retracted, and now the heart valves on the, predominantly on the right side don't really uh, close fully. So whenever the heart pumps, half of the blood volume is actually pumped back into the liver. And, uh, and they, or, uh, that's why people present with the big livers and a lot of lower extremity edema, shortness of breath. So we have in the last 30 years uh, done close to 300 open heart surgeries for carcinoid heart disease. 
So how do we diagnose this? So uh, moving on here, it's a team effort. That's really the most important thing. So you need an exper experienced pathologist. You need really good radiology, but you need a lot of other people. Surgery, uh, gastroenterology, lung specialists, endocrinology, uh, dietitians. I think I need to get another slide because the team is always get it's getting bigger. So uh, the role of the pathologist cannot be overstated. If we got the pathology wrong, everything I do is based on the wrong uh, uh, assumptions. So, and this we see fairly frequently in Europe, up to 25% of patients with neuroendocrine tumors are probably, uh, will have a change in their diagnosis when they go from their uh, regular doctor to a neuroendocrine tumor center. I'm not sure we're that, quite that bad uh, here, but everything hinges on good pathology. So that's why, and I'm not sure if ever, anyone has ever tried to get into my clinic, but uh, if I can't get the pathology, we, we won't schedule a visit because I can't, uh, there's no way I can start a consultation with uh, out there uh, having a pathology review by a pathologist I trust. There, is, uh, there are exceptions if someone is coming from MD Anderson or from Hopkins or Memorial, we'll do it. And, uh, but we need to see the pathology with our own eyes. So as for scans, we use three different types of scans, CT, by far the most uh, helpful in terms of day-to-day -day work. That's really the workhorse in the clinic, but the CT has to be done right. Then we have the MRI. If you're looking at the liver, nothing trumps a good MRI for the liver. Uh, uh, there's just nothing that even comes close. Uh, and then we have PET imaging, so what's called Dorotate PET or someone said receptor PET, SSGR PET, uh, and that can be a PET CT most places or a PET MRI. At Mayo, we use PET MRI, which we find vastly superior for the liver, but PET CT does a really good job for most people, and if you need good liver imaging, just do a PET CT and the regular MRI. And then for the poorly differentiated high-grade tumors, we use the regular PET, which is called FTG PET. So this is radiology 101. So this is one of my patients. So, uh, and this shows the importance of doing good imaging. So, uh, so here you can see the gallium-68 dorotate path. You can see those red dots. These are liver metastases. You can see that uh, maybe you, you can see those slightly brighter spots in the liver. These are also uh, liver metastases, but you can't really see them on this one. This is the venous phase uh, CT. The problem is that most CTs are actually done with a venous phase. If you go to the emergency room and you have a CT for whatever, it's going to be a, a monophasic venous phase CT. You won't, uh, odds are you won't see neurone tumors on it. Uh, you may or you may not. Most of them probably show up uh, to some extent, but if you if you haven't done a dual phase CT in the workup of a neuron tumor, you really haven't had a CT, and uh, so a monophasic CT is is not adequate for most uh, patients. And I think most centers, uh, most of the outside scans I'm seeing now are dual phase. So, what about the the really big, bright uh, tumors on uh, on the PET scans? These are the kidneys. This is a tumor in the pancreas. It looked like big and red and ugly. Well, when we do the MRI, you see it's actually tiny. So this is why PET images often really grossly exaggerate the size of the tumor. So people look at this and go, oh my goodness, is that, is that my liver with all of those really bright spots? And then you look at the CT or the MRI and say, actually, they are not that, that big. This is like looking at light bulbs. So they're like big halo around them. And then when you turn off a uh, uh, light bulb, it's just a tiny little LED. And uh, so uh, sometimes the, uh, the size of the PET is, uh, corresponds to the size of the tumor, but oftentimes the, the size of the PET is much larger. So this is uh, just another example of, of a PET uh, CT here. So someone with a slow growing tumor with bone metastases, see a lot of bone metastases throughout the skeleton. We would not have picked this up reliably with any other method than PET CT or a PET MRI. So sometimes the PET, uh, you just have to use a PET to follow someone. Most of the time you don't use a PET to follow someone, but there are people with bone only or bone dominant disease where you have to use a PET. And then we pick up these unusual metastases, especially with the small bowel neuron tumors, metastases to the breast. Every now and again, we see someone who's diagnosed with breast cancer, turns out to be a small bowel neuron tumor that travels to the breast. Brain tumors are really rare for the, in, in the well uh, differentiated tumors, but orbital tumors, these are, that's a seat, an MRI, PET MRI, you can actually see the eyes here, and behind the eyes, we have these tumors. And that person pre presented with double vision. So this is actually surprisingly common. And then we're picking up these little uh, spots in the, in the heart every now and again, and they don't seem to cause much trouble. Okay, so next chapter. So I was just diagnosed with an neuroendocrine neoplasm. What do I do now? 
So these are my rules, and this uh, this is what I teach my fellows. So this is these are my rules of addressing newly diagnosed cancer. I do more than neuron tumors; I do some other stuff too. But uh, the same rules apply. So number one, did I get the diagnosis right? Has the biopsy been reviewed by a pathologist I trust? Have I done the necessary workup? Did I order the appropriate scans for the based on the biopsy? And the, the selection of the scans actually depends on number one. Did I get the biopsy uh, the, uh, pathology right? I will use a totally different scan for a poorly differentiated neuron carcinoma than I use for a well differentiated neuron tumor. Have I correctly staged this malignancy? Do I have all the labs I need? And then what's the intent of therapy? Are we going for cure? Are we going to uh, for controlling the tumor? Are we controlling symptoms? And then what are the patient's goals and expectations? And I think we need to be honest uh, early on to, and we know most of the time, we actually know what the, the, the goal of the treatment is. And uh, so, so I, I believe in being very upfront and honest with people early on. If I, don't, uh, if I, do, if I think that the curative treatment is not an option, I will let people know that. So moving on, so ask uh, your doctor these questions. So these are sort of similar to uh, what I said before. So what's your experience in managing patients with NENS? So if I was getting an ele electrician to do a really complicated job at my house, I'd s have you asked them, have you set up that kind of a router before? And uh, so you do the, so nothing wrong uh, to ask your doctor the same question. So, uh, and the NENS are uncommon, and even the busiest, busiest oncologists out there may not see a whole lot of them. And uh, ask them again, do you have the right diagnosis? Are there more tests needed? Should I see an expert? This is really important to, to ask. And if uh, I get a, a non-expert opinion, are you willing to work with that expert? And if your oncologist says no, you pr should probably find another oncologist. And um, so, but. That is so rare. Honestly, I can't think of an instance in the last five years where the uh, oncologist I'm collaborating with in the community did not want to work with us. So, but I, I, I heard this from patients. So I heard it uh, a few years ago, someone sought another opinion and the oncologist said, if you're going to Mayo, I'm not gonna see you again. So, um, so that's, we're, I think we're all in this for the same reason. We all, I think we all went to medicine for the same reason. We wanna help people. So what's the role of the NET Expert Center? So obviously confirm the diagnosis is correct. Uh, and as I said in this uh, German study there, up to 25% of patients uh, with the neurant neoplasms will have a change in the, uh, the diagnosis. And then to be available at crucial time points. But here's where, where it gets a little tricky. So uh, all of us are very, very busy. And if you, if you come to a NET Center and we say, yeah, this is a great plan, come back if, uh, if things are not going well. And we do this often. And then when things are not going well, you've just found out that there's a scan that looks bad. I want to go back to my net expert center and then we might not be able to get you in for four or six weeks. And so I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to deal with that because we're probably always booked like two to three months in advance and we have very, very little uh, uh, bandwidth to add on uh, so uh, to the clinics unless we started seeing patients like double overbooking, which we don't want to do because these are complicated uh, cases. So, um, so then we can sometimes do this by, by collaborating with uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the oncologist in the community and say, hey, yeah, so yeah, probably good, good idea to come back to the expert, ex expert center, but until then, let's do this. So we at the expert centers, we have clinical trials, we have specialized surgery, tumor boards, and things like that. But there are some problems with getting a lot of second opinions. So uh, one of them is that in a tumor like uh, neuron craniaplasms, uh, we don't have a whole lot a lot of data for a lot of the decisions we do. So everyone has their own opinion. This is how I've done it in uh, like the last 20 years. I'm guilty of that as well. As well. And this has worked for me, but that may not be uh, the opinion of another net expert. And then uh, many and many of these uh, decisions we make are just based on prior experience. And I sometimes like to quote Will Rogers, who said, good judgment come from experience, and a lot of that comes from bad judgment. So, and that, then I'm saying that collectively as a specialty, we've gone through that, we know from the past what didn't work. And, uh, and uh, then the more opinions you get, you're gonna get the different recommendations, sometimes like vastly different. It doesn't necessarily mean that one is right and one is wrong, but this can create a lot of anxiety among patients. And sometimes uh, they uh, ask, well, can you guys all talk uh, about, uh, and we 
that's just not feasible. We just can't do that. And this can delay starting the treatment. So let's quickly go through some of the treatment uh, considerations, and I'm running out of time here. So, uh, so what are the goals of uh, the treatment? To relieve symptoms of functional uh, syndrome, bulky tumors, and to prolong survival. And don't forget that uh, net patients, they are all different. I, I, I can't say this often enough, that one size does not fit all. And it doesn't have to necessarily deal with the tumor, also with the patient. And um, so things to consider before starting therapy, is treatment really needed? I think the, uh, the most underused uh, uh, treatment for uh, neuroendocrine tumors, well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumors especially, is to do nothing. So I have so many patients in my clinic where I'm doing nothing, including two yesterday. I said, we're not going to do anything. I can see the tumors, but they've changed like this much in three years. And uh, so we're not going to do anything. And uh, so sometimes you have to know when not to act. And, uh, and sometimes you've got to act quickly. And uh, we want to know where it started because that may determine what the treatments we use, the states and grade and all of the stuff we talked about before. And then uh, you have to uh, be mindful of what is appropriate for one person may not be appropriate for another person with exactly the same tumor. And that could be, let's say, diabetes. So if you have diabetes, Everolimus or Afinitor may not be the best drug for you. If you have really high blood pressure, sunitinib or cabozantinib may not be the best drug for you. At some point, we might use it, but not now. So, and then consider the financial toxicity of therapy. We talk way too little about that. That needs to be studied more. And then for younger persons, uh, reproductive toxicity is something we have to address. And then long-term consequences of therapy, most importantly, the low risk of leukemia following PRRT. So, before we start uh, the treatment, so again, the team approach, we don't need a tumor board for every single patient. That's, uh, so some places in Europe do that. Every case is discussed in tumor board. We don't need that. We're experts in this, at least at the, uh, the net centers. We've done this thousands of time, times before. So, but we need the tumor, we really need the tumor boards for the challenging decisions. That's why I want to save the tumor board time where I really need the brain power in the room. So why tumor board? Because more brains work better than fewer brains. And uh, then you have multiple specialties in the room, and instead of uh, you having to see five different specialties over three consecutive days, now I can see you, I can take, be your representative at tumor board, and then I can circle back to you and say, this is what my tumor board said. This is what the surgeon said. This is what the radiologist said. So I can save you a lot of time by presenting your case at tumor board, but it doesn't have to be every time. And uh, Use it sparingly and wisely. So we treat the symptoms with uh, somatostatin analogs, octreotide and lanreotide, other drugs uh, for uh, symptoms. We're going to go into all of these details. So I'm just going to fast forward through this because you're going to hear a lot about this in uh, the next few days. So uh, skip through that. This is the final part. I just wanted to explain to you some of the thought, as I, or some of the concepts we use for uh, for survival or life expectancy. So you have to take into account many different uh, factors. So if you have someone with uh, a neuroendocrine tumor who is uh, is uh, in their 80s with uh, severe congestive heart failure, and compare that person to someone in their 20s. Well, the person in the 20s is going to live with this for decades. The other person might die within two years of something completely unrelated. And uh, the other thing very important to uh, remember is that the survival numbers come from large groups of patients, not from individuals. So there's a huge variability, and I tell pe people, well, you may have read that the average survival is X, but that's a group of like 1,000 people, people, and that's not necessarily you. So, uh, so, uh, so be careful with that. So the median overall survival is one of the most commonly uh, reported number. So again, applies to a group of people. And, uh, and uh, this is really the time it takes. Let's say if we have 100 uh, uh, patients and we follow them over time, and the time point, point where 50 uh, of them have died, that's our median overall survival. I'll show you that in, in a graph here in the next slide. But there can be a lot of things that affect this. Let's say if someone got diagnosed with a neuroendocrine tumor and uh, goes on a clinical trial and then leaves the clinic and, uh, and doesn't look to the left and right while crossing the street and gets hit by a car and dies, that person actually counts in the trial as a, a short survival or can. So, so I'm just saying that you have to be mindful of these, uh, these uh, uh, things. So this is how I explain the median survival. So at the at initial time point, let's say this is like time zero where we started, we have a set number of patients, uh, and then we start whatever treatment, and over time, uh, 
at some point in time, we're going to be at a point where half of them have died of whatever reason. So that time point is the median survival. So, uh, but this only applies to groups of people. So just keep that in mind. I tell my patients, you don't have a timestamp on you. You're not like a card of milk or something. And uh, so it's a, it's a, be really careful with the, with these numbers. And um, yeah, so I think I addressed some of these here. So we have some other uh, numbers like time to progression, uh, progression-free survival, and things of, uh, of that nature. One, the, the number I find the most helpful is probably the five-year survival. This is to look at the survival numbers at, uh, let's say, five years after a diagnosis or five years after we started some, some therapy. So think of 100 patients again and, uh, and say, how many of them are alive five years from now? That's the five-year survival. So I'm not going into any survival numbers. I'm just trying to explain these concepts uh, to you. And this is important because survival is really uh, closely associated with uh, grade and stage. So that takes me to the end of my presentation. So uh, I could go on for hours if you wanted. So, but I think we have some such fine speakers lining up here. So